one of the fun things about being a moderator is you get to read these wonderful bios of people who uh, have genuine interest in the same things we do. Uh, it's my pleasure this morning to introduce our first speaker, Peter Swanson. Uh, this may be unique, but he's a producer and director of films, has been directing and edited films for 20 plus years, currently working on a PBS series that looks at the personal I the issues of poverty and global, uh, on a global and personal scale, and it's called A Dollar a Day. But what he also brings to us in 1999 and 2000, he works as a series director on a program called Water, The Drop of Life, which is a six hour series on water. His background is immense. He's won regional Emmys, American Centers, uh, Golden Eagles, Golden State Regional Awards, and on and on and on. Uh, and for Rotary, where you get the connection, he's the one that created the DVD, Rotary, The Water Story, which is now available and also as a download. Peter? Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank uh, Jim and Sue Bodenner for the opportunity to speak to you today. It's really an honor and a privilege to be speaking in front of a group of Rotarians. I'm so impressed with Rotary. It's really a, an organization of movers and shakers, people who get things done. Speaking of getting things done, I need a little help. Uh, Jim Bodenner, could you help me out a little bit here? I want you guys to watch Jim. Jim is doing something that's being, saving lives all around the world. He's carrying water. How's it going there, Jim? I'm actually getting Jim back because he made me carry my camera and tripod up a mountain yeah. in the Dominican Republic. So this is payback time. So what, what was that like, Jim? That was heavy. Heavy? It was heavy. I had to put it on my head, but... Uh, All right. Let's give Jim a hand. Yeah. All kidding aside, this is actually pretty serious business. One in six people in the world today still have to carry water from their source to their home. And guess what, Jim? It's done by women. So, a few years ago, I had a privilege of working on a series on, on water, and I'm going to show you a, a few clips uh, from it this morning. And we did a series about, uh, we did a clip on this subject of carrying water. We called it The Walk of Life. So, let me get the DVD going, and I will uh, start play the first clip. Can we dim the lights a little bit for this? This is the story of water. It is a story of life and death, of rich and poor, of beauty, despair, crisis and hope. It is a story told with the help of global personalities, people who believe that it may be the most important story of the new century. The Middle East is becoming slowly a desert. It's about your stewardship of what you inherit and how well you take care of it and pass it on. Ultimately, human being in the mercy of the nature. In this episode, we will explore the nature and politics of water transportation and its impact on a growing number of people and enterprises, ultimately leading to an issue that will be highly debated in the next decades, the price of water, the drop of life.
Africa's Rift Valley, stretching from central Kenya to Tanzania, a region of farmers, hunter-gatherers, and cattle herders. Here, the ritual of water transportation is at the very core of life for the pastoral people who roam the rift, the Maasai. Maasai women and children must embark daily on a walk for water, an activity that is literally a walk of life. They gather in sisterhood at the waterhole, where bonds are strong in times of peace and war. These women, like others in similar regions the world over, congregate at rivers and streams, wells and wadis, to find and fetch water in a manner thousands of years old. Throughout the Rift Valley, where scarcity of permanent water sources combined with inadequate distribution systems, women and children of the Maasai must shoulder the burden of transportation. Even a scant source of water is seen as nothing short of divine bounty. For as every Maasai knows, the gods may take the gift away without warning, leaving the land parched, its people and cattle hollow-eyed and helpless. Without this walk of life, the Maasai would have to abandon their nomadic ways and be forced to crowd around the few concentrations of natural water to be found in the Rift Valley. Transporting water from the well to the home has always been a great challenge for people all over the world. Although many of us take this process for granted, even some world leaders understand this burden. To me, someone who grew up in the Northern Caucasus, the region that suffered 52 cases of drought over a period of 100 years, water means a lot. There has always been a problem with fresh water supply in that area. I remember in my childhood when I, as a young boy, used to walk a distance of one and a half kilometers to fetch some fresh water and bring it home. We also used to collect rainwater to do our laundry. In other words, Shortage of fresh water has always been a pressing problem over there. People in the villages all over the world know how precious water is, especially the women, the women who go every day, sometimes twice a day, walking miles with a jar on their heads to collect the water for the family, the water for cooking and for everything, for washing. They know how heavy it is, the burden to carry it, how precious it is, how much every drop counts. So as you can see, this really is a burden. And it's not just a burden because it's heavy. It's a burden because it takes time. If you have to spend two or three hours a day carrying water, you don't have time to help with the family income. And it's also a cause of serious health issues. Women all over the world are having problems with serious compressions of the spinal cord from carrying water on their head. Now we'll look at some creative solutions to this a bit later. And I know that Ron Denham will talk to you about what Rotary is doing. But I wanted to begin my talk with this walk of life just to illustrate that most people in the world can't take daily water for granted. And this is the real lesson for us here in the US. I think most of us still take water for granted. I know I still do. I wake up in the morning and take a shower, and I expect the water to be there. And I expect it to be clean and safe. But we do have water problems here in the US, and they come in unexpected ways. I would guess that most of you don't think that you have a water problem at your dinner table. Now, I'm not talking about the beverages you drink. I'm talking about the food you eat. That's right, water. It's what's for dinner. Take a look at this next clip. We can do the lights again. 
Are you still working on that? In countries like ours, which always has had a good supply of water, we're just seeing the, the horizon of need to conserve water. As we enter the 21st century, farmers who grow different staple crops in other parts of the world face similar challenges. Southwest Kansas, at the heart of America's High Plains District. This warm summer evening, like so many others throughout the land, is all about beef. key to everything in this farm country, including beef, is water. In fact, the raising of beef soaks up 30% of the total agricultural water supply, and the demand for beef worldwide is growing. The connection between water and high-quality Kansas beef is one all-important crop, corn. Across America's high plains, the struggle for water to nurture crops spans many generations. Some farmers here can still remember the droughts of the 1930s that ruined their crops. Farmers like Melvin Winger. It was all dry land, farmed uh, mostly wheat, and uh, it didn't raise near as much, and uh, didn't have fertilizer, we didn't have a lot of things we have now. So we didn't raise very much crops, and it was... Uh, just kind of sustaining yourself. Relief came in the late 1930s, when farmers drilling boreholes for water discovered the Ogallala Aquifer. Like most aquifers, Ogallala's recharge comes directly from precipitation falling on the soil and seeping below. The discovery of this aquifer allowed farmers to irrigate on a grand scale. Seas of corn sustain a huge agricultural economy. From the skies, you can see huge circular irrigation patterns spreading out across the southwest Kansas landscape. From the ground, the source is just as visible. Giant center pivot arms reach for almost one kilometer, delivering water to thirsty cornfields. But irrigation is not without complications. Much of the water sprayed high into the air by old-style high-pressure sprinklers is lost to evaporation. In addition, pesticides and fertilizers pollute the water that seeps into the ground. And the waste of irrigation water on such a large scale threatens to dry out these vast oceans of grain. For too long, southwest Kansas farmers had been mining aquifer water to meet the demands of agribusiness without considering the consequences of continually exceeding the recharge rate. When the amount of water withdrawn from an aquifer continually exceeds the recharge, nature's underground tank starts running low. It's gradually decreasing gradually going down, and we're doing a better job all the time of managing our water and doing more with less. Today's farmers, young and old, realize that the time for action is now. America's heartland and world markets cannot afford another disaster like in the 30s. Through the Western Kansas Irrigation Research Project, Kansas State University is helping farmers reduce their rate of water use and prolong the life of the Ogallala Aquifer. Researchers are testing different types of low-level, high-efficiency nozzle heads. This precision system will allow farmers to deliver irrigation directly to the plants, 
preventing the loss of large amounts of water to evaporation. Although far more work must be done to preserve water, these combined efforts have begun to move large agribusiness operations toward becoming more sustainable providers of food for a growing global population. You know, it takes about as much water to float a battleship to raise one steer. So that's really amazing. And water problems are not unique to the Midwest and the U.S. In Oregon and the Kalmuth River Basin, fishermen and farmers are fighting over water. The fishermen say the farmers are taking too much water out of the river and the salmon can't get up and spawn. And Georgia and Florida are fighting over water. Waters across borders, watersheds and rivers. People all over the country are scrambling to find more water. And one of the most grandiose ideas, and something that might be of interest to people up here in Michigan, is I've heard people want to build a pipeline from the Great Lakes down south. Now, I don't know much about local or regional politics, <laughs> but I'd caution you about any major diversion of water. Any time that you take large amounts of water from one place and move it to another, there are consequences. And the world has a pretty serious example of this. It's called the Aral Sea. Let me show you the next clip. I was dealing a lot with water problems, including the problem concerning the distribution of water from the rivers Amur Daria and Sir Daria. The inhabitants of this region are confronted with an extremely pressing water problem that has a negative effect on the fate of the Aral Sea. I have a sea, a land where the fish live. Spring comes soon because spring and summer bring a lot of fish. I have a golden carp. If you want to eat it, you must come to us. <laughs> Stark white fields, salt covered shoreline. Long abandoned boats strewn about on sandy waves of endless desert. Here, relics of past prosperity offer mute testimony to one of the world's greatest environmental disasters. The Aral Sea, a vast inland lake bisecting the republics of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Originally, the Aral Sea was the size of the entire country of Ireland. For centuries, the Amu and Sir Darya rivers had provided the Aral Sea with constant fresh water, enriching its mineral composition and promoting diverse marine life. Fifty years ago, in an effort to bolster Russia's textile industry, Russian Premier Nikita Khrushchev ordered the diversion of water from the Amu Darya and Sir Darya rivers to the white gold fields, the cotton farms of Uzbekistan. Unlined and open ditch methods used to irrigate Uzbekistan's cotton fields led to wide-scale inefficiencies. Fully 80% of the water diverted from the Amu and Sir Darya rivers for cotton farming was lost to evaporation and seepage. From the very beginning, Khrushchev's decision to divert this life-giving flow caused problems. The Aral Sea began to shrink and its salinity increased. Today, half of the Aral Sea has been lost. It is a loss of monumental proportions. With the Aral Sea drying up and cotton production struggling to produce acceptable yields, a crisis began to affect some 30 million people all across Central Asia. In the early 1950s, 
the Aral Sea's commercial fishing industry was flourishing, providing 60,000 people with jobs, homes, and a thriving, comfortable community life. Today, that industry is gone. Those who lived through the tragedy are haunted by bittersweet memories. The sea fishing port and a fish processing plant were situated here. Its coastline went from here out further to the west. In this port, we have piers where the cargo was loaded and unloaded. Over there, a bit further, you see a sawmill where we saw the timber for the ships. Further away, you see the depot of the fishing port. With more than 20,000 square kilometers of salty, barren sea floor exposed, up to 43 million tons of contaminated dust is carried each year by winds and deposited on croplands and populated areas. In a region now gripped with poverty, children dig salt for money. But even the meager amounts of salt which they mine with their hands is a toxic menace, loaded with pesticides used in agriculture. At a local health station, doctors and nurses confront epidemics of lung disease and throat cancer and anemia, blown to epidemic proportions, all brought on by a toxic dust, the residue of a ravaged environment, an environment robbed of its fresh water. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, the future of the Aral Sea and those who live there now rests with the Central Asian republics in the Amu Darya and Sir Darya river basins. These republics are seeking help from international institutions, organizations with expertise in water management. A European-sponsored consulting firm is experimenting with ways to boost crop yields while reducing water usage. Until recently, Uzbeki cotton growers have used four to five times as much water as their counterparts in other nations. New programs are already aiming at cutting that usage in half. Farm restructuring and reforms are only beginning to improve the health of the Aral environment. Even with efforts to improve the situation, the fate of the Aral Sea is irreversible. Uninformed decisions made many years ago have permanently scarred this land and its people. So, even though you have huge amounts of water up here, don't ever take it for granted. But what about places where there's very little water to begin with? Well, this is one of the things that Rotary does really well. I've seen firsthand how Rotary goes deep into communities and works with local populations, not only to increase the quantity of water available, but the quality as well. And I'm sure you're going to hear more about that later on today. But I want to leave you with one other low-tech idea that's working in Chile. In the mountains of Chile, there's a village called Chungungo. And despite being a coastal village, its fresh water supply is extremely limited. But since 1992, a Canadian project more than doubled the water available to this village by using a very simple technology that was able to capture untapped water that engulfed the village daily. This water literally it surrounded the village every day for decades, but went unused. I'm talking about fog. In the extreme dryness of Chungungo, Chile, an ingenious use of a mysterious resource has helped the village get a handle on its chronic water problems. In the northern part of Chile, we have one of the driest deserts in the world. However, there is a, a climatic um, circumstance that is very favorable, something called the Camanchaca. Camanchaca is a very heavy 
a fog that comes usually uh, with a cold wind. And they have developed a system, the Chileans in conjunction with, with Canadians, a system to harvest the water from the fog. Caleta Chungungo, a small Chilean fishing village located about 450 kilometers north of Santiago, huddled in the shadow of the coastal mountains. For decades, the 350 residents of Chungungo have lived with a chronic water shortage by transporting water 50 kilometers in an old tanker truck once or twice a week. The cost of the water was high and the quality suspect. There used to be a shortage of water. We did not receive any water. The water only reached the camp. It didn't reach Jungungo. There was a shortage, but we had an arrangement with our neighbors. In the mid-1980s, villagers working with Canadian developers devised a plan to mimic the action of the leaves on the town's eucalyptus trees. They reasoned that if the leaves could catch moisture, which in turn form droplets, might not the villagers construct nets, which could likewise catch the fog. Today, using huge plastic mesh nets, Chungungo fog collectors actually catch the fog and harvest the droplets. Dripping down the mesh, the water droplets fall into gutters. A pipeline then carries the water from the gutters down the mountain to tanks and into the taps of homes and businesses of the village. And they have transformed completely the, the little village of Chungungo, which was totally lost because it was very underdeveloped and poor. There was no water. And now um, the um, amount of water available per person has doubled. At a time when scarcity of quality water increases and huge costs are associated with filling the gap, inexpensive and practical solutions are raising interest in other areas of the world. So, with some creativity and some imagination, both in abundant supply within Rotary, water supplies can be found and communities can develop. Clean water is, in fact, critical to international development, and real progress cannot be made on poverty issues without addressing water issues. And addressing water issues is something that Rotary is taking on in a big way. I want to acknowledge the tireless work of people like Ron Denham and Jim Bodenner, who continue to spend countless hours traversing the globe preaching the gospel of water. They need your help, and I know that Rotarians will come through. I am confident that Rotary will marshal the resources to help, help us meet the Millennium Development Goals around water, the drop of life. Thank you very much.